It's the SNL Hall of Fame podcast with your host, Jamie Dew. Chief Librarian, Thomas Senna. And featuring Matt Ardill. And now, Curator of the Hall, Jamie Dew. Thank you so much, Doug Nats. It is great to be here inside the SNL Hall of Fame with you all. Now, careful listeners of the show pointed out to me that I didn't remind you to wipe your feet last week. It's not lost to me. I truly thought I had solidified my stance on this matter to the extent that it would become the norm. But alas, if you are paying for the pay-per-view feed right now, you can see that I'm holding a mop. Jeepers creepers, peoples, wipe your damn feet. The SNL Hall of Fame podcast is a weekly affair where each episode we take a deep dive into the career of a former cast member, host, musical guest, or writer, and add them to the ballot for your consideration. Once the nominees have been announced, we turn to you, the listener, to vote for the most deserving and help determine who will be enshrined for perpetuity in the hall. And that's how we play the game. Let's go to our friend Matthew Ardill right now because the game that we like to play is learning a little bit about our nominee and that's exactly what we're going to do. Let me just put this mop down and okay. Oh gosh, I'm parched. There's something going on with my voice. Matthew, old man. Jamie, how are you my doing good... this week? I am good, thanks. And you? I'm a little shaky in the voice, it seems. <laughs> maybe you need some water. Let me take a sip of this water. That's better. It it is delicious. We talked about water last week. We'll we'll put a pin in it until next week. Yes. We don't want to, you know, give away the farm, as it were. Yeah. My Rudolph, huh? Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm really looking forward to sharing uh, about Maya's life. She is an incredible character. This is interesting because this is her last kick at the can. If she doesn't get in this time, and I believe she had, she was hovering around 58 or 59%. uh, So she needs, you know, almost 10% to get in, 10% more to get in. And if she doesn't get in, she's off the ballot. That would be a shame because she is an incredible performer and a hilarious person. So Take this as a war egg, not telling people how to vote, but just be mindful of that, folks. This is their last chance. Yeah. Well, let's hear some uh, trivia to maybe sway some people. Yeah. Uh, Maya Rudolph is, is five foot seven, birthday July 27th, 1972. She has 118 acting credits, 12 producer credits, two writing credits, and 30 soundtrack credits. Um, she was born in Gainesville, Florida, but was raised in L.A., the daughter of uh, singer Minnie Ripperton and composer Richard Rudolph. Her mother is the singer of the song Lovin' You, uh, which I have now three times brought up to my wife and every every time we hear it. And she goes, if you're going to tell me Maya Rudolph's mom sang this one more time, I'm going to throw a saw, uh, throw a pillow at you. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, she did. And uh, in fact, if you listen to the single. You can hear her singing Maya, 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 because this is a lullaby that she wrote for Maya and what's used to sing her to sleep. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Now, and her grandfather uh, on her father's side, Sidney J. Rudolph, owned all of the Wendy's and Rudy's restaurants in Dade County, Florida. So he was a- No Rudy's, but Wendy's, that would be amazing. I love Wendy's. Fast food entrepreneur. She was childhood friends with Gwyneth Paltrow, and their families were actually very close to the point that her dad was hired by Bruce Paltrow to supervise music on his film duets. Music runs in her blood. Uh, her brother is, a, is also in the music industry as an engineer. When she was seven or eight, this is actually when she fell in love with comedy. Uh, she saw a friend hurt themselves and start crying, so she started doing a funny voice that made them laugh. And, and, uh, <laughs> 
she thought to herself, this is much uh, better than feeling bad. I want to make her feel good. And that's sort of been her philosophy going forward. She studied at photography at University of Santa Cruz and formed a band called Super Sauce with classmates before joining the band The Rentals, which yes. was fronted by Matt Sharp. Was, Matt Sharp, yeah. Um, they released several singles, including Seven More Minutes, Barcelona, and My Head is in the Sun. She toured singing. Oh, you got to say Friends of P. Oh, uh, Friends of P. Okay. Yeah. 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 But yeah, she toured singing Backup and playing Moog Synthesizer. when the Friends band with P. Sorry. I apologize. There you go. Sorry. Uh, yeah. But uh, when, when the band broke up, she actually decided to start pursuing comedy and joined the Groundlings. Um, she has been in two Oscar nominated films. Uh, and has indicated her dream reboot would be to either remake Tootsie or play Violet or Dora Lee in a nine to five reboot. I want that nine to five reboot. Oh, that's that's that feels like low hanging fruit. Like that in a would, good way. Like how yeah, has that not been done? There's exactly. Fall that's guy, like for heaven's sake. Yeah, like that's that's like 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 you said, low hanging fruit in that it's so obviously awesome. Yeah. You know? So it's like, why would you not do that? And I can just imagine her singing the song too, like the working nine to five. Like it'd just be beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. So she she later formed a Prince cover band called Princess with her friend Gretcher Liberum in 2011, and Prince himself was a big fan. Oh my so gosh. This shows there's no bad blood over the Prince show sketch. Um, <laughs> Now, she she first the first time she actually met Prince was on a five hour plane ride. Uh, He asked if they had met before and she thought he must have confused her with someone else. But he later came back and asked if her baby sang to her. And she said, yeah, she makes noise all the time. Prince responded, maybe that's your mom. The first time I saw your mom was on the Mike Douglas show. I shed a tear. So Prince was just. Such a beautiful human being. There's like a connection there between the two of them. Yeah. I'm speechless. I'm speechless right now. Well, I mean, that's how Prince leaves everyone at one point or another, you know, just does something so miraculous and wild and awesome that you're just like, I've got no words. No words at all. Well, we have a lot more words, though, coming your way uh, in a conversation between Thomas and Rebecca North. This should be a good one, uh, Matt. Yeah, looking forward to it. So let's uh, head down to Thomas now. Right, Matt and JD, thank you so much. Yes, we are talking about somebody who has been a very beloved cast member who has been on the uh, ballot since season one. So this is like one of those very special episodes of the SNL Hall of Fame where we get to almost relitigate or reexamine somebody's candidacy. Somebody who I'm surprised isn't already in the SNL Hall of Fame because this person's so beloved. So I'm excited today to chat about Maya Rudolph and joining me a first timer here on the SNL Hall of Fame podcast. Rebecca North is joining me to chat about Maya Rudolph. Rebecca, how are you doing today? I'm good, Thomas. I'm happy to be here. This is my first time, so I'm excited to voice my opinions about someone who I'm shocked. It's been five seasons now and still has not made it to the Hall of Fame, and that was groundbreaking to me so i'm here to vouch for maya and kind of talk through her career and history on snl so yeah can't wait yeah we'll dig in to see like my why she might not be or we'll, we'll definitely try to make a another case for her uh hall of fame candidacy for sure and you're a great person to come on and talk with me uh, about this you and i were teammates a uh, long time two years ago on a uh, the saturday night network's trivia 
we did a little uh, trivia together. So I don't know that we won. We were going up against like Bill Kenny and stuff, and he probably yeah. dominated <laughs> us. But but that's how we first came in contact. And you've been doing stuff over at the Saturday Night Network off and on. Uh, what have you been up to over at the SNN uh, recently? Yeah, I was actually thinking about that. That was my first episode on SNN as a guest for trivia, and we did get annihilated, but it was fun. I feel like very insightful. Like I learned a lot through that. When I was signed up, I was like, oh, it's going to be a piece of cake. And then, uh, no, we were up against people who have been watching for live for a million years and rewatch it and do all that. So Mm -hmm. that was fun. But yeah, I'm over at the uh, Saturday Night Network and I'm going on a lot of those roundtables, recapping the episodes and just really enjoying this season leading up to season 50 of SNL, which is going to be a huge one. So loving kind of the gap bridging between like millennials and Gen Z, specifically on the show and the writing staff. So this has been like an exciting kind of transitional season for that, at least I'm viewing, where some of the guests are people that most of the viewers have never heard of, but they're mm-hmm. really exciting to me. So I'm excited to get really just into SNL this season. And yeah, it's been a really interesting season. I like hearing you on the hot take shows and the the roundtables because I think you and I often share similar sensibilities and similar opinions mm-hmm. with the show. And I think your your opinions are they're mostly positive, they're fair, but you're not like you're not just gonna say everything's great. That's what I like. You have a discerning eye uh, for this. So I think your voice on the on the SNN and uh, the roundtables and such, I think is is a really nice perspective, Rebecca. So I'm glad you're sharing that perspective with us today. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. I also know we both have a shared love for pop culture and all things there. So it's going to be exciting to talk about someone who was on the show and is really just pivotal in pop culture, I think, like, as far as some of those, um, not earlier, but like middle of SNL uh, cast members go. I think mm-hmm. Maya is definitely someone we've seen is very well known just in the worlds and yeah. people that have never even watched SNL know Maya Rudolph. It's just a name, which is why I'm so shocked that season five, she's still not in the Hall of Fame. I know so she pops up excited. everywhere too. Like, <laughs> like so many shows that I watch, like, uh, is it the, um, the Good Place? Like yes. I didn't even expect her to pop up in the good place, and she played the judge. And my wife and I were like, "Oh my gosh, Maya Rudolph!" Like we were so excited. So she just mm-hmm. does that. She's just like omnipresent in pop culture. That was actually a reference that when I was thinking about her before this, it was such a small character, but had such an impact on the good place that yeah, I really love that. I'm glad you brought that one up. No, absolutely. That's what she does. Maya just pops up and then like everybody, we all get excited (laughs) to see Maya on our screen. She's like an electric performer. Uh, Rebecca, I'm curious uh, about since you're a first timer here on the show, you've never, you know, haven't shared obviously uh, your SNL fandom with us. So uh, tell us about like your SNL fandom. When did you start watching the show? Any particular cast members or casts in general? Mm -hmm. So I watched the show a lot. It was very big in my household. Uh, my parents aren't super fans, but they don't miss an episode. They watch every Saturday night. No matter what they would do, they would have it on TiVo, I remember, growing up. And then DVR it to watch it. Just every Saturday night, they go to sleep after the news and watch the rest the next day. And I think around high school is when I started to appreciate SNL. I actually, the other side of me, I'm big on pop culture, but I became very just interested in politics. Um, and mm-hmm. just learning a lot more about this world, because I feel like, I would have conversations with people and actually even no clue what I was talking about. And that was something that I was always like missing. And then I actually really got into SNL because of the politics and the stances there and seeing um, Tina Fey as Sarah Palin. And I suddenly knew who Sarah Palin was and knew how to give an opinion and a, a stance and know that. So that's actually what really like hooked me. I've always been a big comedy fan. Like, any sitcom that I even do some stand up now and sketch oh, really? around New York. Yeah, I dabble. I'm not oh. super well versed, but I started when I lived well, in Seattle. It takes a like, lot to even dabble. I, yes. I've done it once. I did a five minute set once, and I'm like, this is five. tough. Five for your first set is yeah. a lot. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah. I So I lived in Seattle during the pandemic, and I'm not from there, so I'm from New York. And the way that I actually got to meet people was I took an improv class. And through that, I don't, um, not an improv girl, but I met someone that was like, I feel like you do good stand up. You want to come with me one night? And that's actually how I made a lot of like 
my social life and friends there is just going to open mics, doing open mics, working on things with people. So that's how I got into that. And then when I moved back to New York, the way that I met some other people here was taking a sketch class at People's Improv Theater. And through that, going to a lot of shows and open mics and just making connections with people. So comedy has always just been at the root of things um, in my life. But then really, when I started like understanding it and really appreciating the show, that it was like a universal experience, but I just never sat and watched. I think around high school time is that when my parents would record it, even if I was doing my thing, running around like at night, every Sunday, like even to date, like I don't usually watch it live. I watch it every single Sunday. It's part of my routine now. Okay. I watch it. Like, Sunday, 11 o'clock, I wake up, I'm making breakfast, and I'm watching SNL. And it's basically just been a constant in my life. And a lot of it really stemmed, weirdly enough, from getting to know and learn and understand politics in a fun way. Yeah. As yeah. fun as they can be these past few years, anyway. It's so. really interesting. Yeah, I don't often uh, hear people say it was politics. So even though SNL's synonymous with politics, that's a really neat way to get into the show. I, I, I love it. And so, like, when did you first take notice of Maya Rudolph as a performer. Was it SNL? It was SNL. So Maya Rudolph and Kristen Wiig are like my two favorite cast members of all time. And a lot of it was their interactions with each other. And I was able to see a lot of like myself and my friends in them and the way that they interact and the way that they bring each other onto their projects in real life or even watching them on a talk show or red carpet or they're presenting an award at the Emmys together. Like... The way that they interacted, I also felt the same, similar with Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, where I was just like, me and my girlfriend just sit and do this, and we just kind of shoot the shit and talk and are funny and friends, and I think that's what really felt relatable to me, and I think in actually some of the the sketches that I like think so highly of Maya in, a lot of them are her and Kristen are just her being her, but in like a funny way and adapting. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like that's what drew me in to her is like, I could see myself being friends with her. And I can't say that about everyone that's been on this show, but I'm like, right. you're someone that like, I'd get coffee with and I feel like I'd have a great time. So she, yeah, I could yeah. see that. Definitely. It seems like she'd be easy to be friends with. For yeah. sure. Yeah. If she was my friend, she would probably say, you know what, Thomas, I'm so dis I'm disappointed. I've been on the ballot for this is my fifth time on the ballot now. And I'm not yeah. in the Hall of Fame yet. Like, what's the deal? So, <laughs> so yeah, you have voting, to make it up to her to get a friendship. I know. Jeez, I know. Yeah. I'm sorry, Maya. So in season <laughs> one, she had 47% of the vote. Seasons two, three, and four, actually, it's been hovering around 58%. Like, it's been very, very steady. So almost like knocking at the door, Rebecca, uh, the candidates need 66.7% of okay. the vote to get in so two about two thirds of the vote so she's like knocking on that door but mm -hmm. not quite over the hump so why do you think like do you have any theories as to why Maya hasn't got over that hump and been voted into the hall yeah so something that stuck out to me as a reason why I love her but I actually could see people not is obviously we've seen her do countless impressions on the show so from Beyonce to Kamala Harris to just all of these different people but she still kind of maintains Maya in that. And I think maybe from an impressionist point of view, you look at someone like top of mind right now is Chloe Fineman. And you look at Chloe and she's an impressionist. Whenever she puts a wig on, she embodies that person. And Maya, the similar to if Sarah Sherman does an impression, if I'm just relating it to this season, sure. is it's Sarah Sherman still. And you still have all of her quirks and all of that. Maya is very that. And that's actually why I like her because I'm like, yeah, you're, um, you're not blending completely into this person. I think there are two types of people that do impressions on SNL. People, J.A.J., that just completely embodies that. And you actually might not be able to tell who is who if they're talking next to each other. And people that sometimes are funnier to me is someone that, like, their quirks and their characters has come through. And it's, like, Maya Rudolph as Kamala Harris. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's even funnier to me than an actual spot-on impression because... If you're not going to do a perfect impression, at least let your comedy come through. But that's that's something that I specifically like. I have dabbled in the space and I'm not an impressionist. Um, I made a joke that the only impression I could do is like either a 60-year-old chain smoker or like an old man just based on my voice <laughs> and my stature. Um, I'm just like, I, you would see me through any impression I've done. So that is something that like shines out to me is that like 
I love that and respect them when someone could do that and make it funny and really let themselves come through that. Like A.D. Bryant as well as someone that sticks mm-hmm. out. Like you're laughing at them. You're not laughing at the spot on impression. So I see the flip side of maybe people being like, Maya is always Maya. No matter what she is, what character she's playing, what impression she's doing, it's still Maya Rudolph as that person. It's not her embodying someone, which I respect. But I think that actually could be one of the reasons that she hasn't gotten her way onto the ballot yet. Yeah, I think that I think that's a pretty good theory. You do bring up a good point about impressions that I wanted to circle back to too, because we've talked about on the SNL Hall of Fame, we've talked about impressions quite a bit and like what what your taste in impressions is and what you look for. And I think the way Maya's done it is preferable to me over somebody who's like technically sound. We've had a lot of impressionists on SNL who are technically great impressionists. Some recent ones mm-hmm. actually who didn't quite hit on the show because i think with an impression rebecca you have to have a take and it has to be funny you can't to me you only get so much mileage out of just sounding like the person and looking Mm -hmm. like the person like you actually have to have some comedic value to the impression so i don't want to bring up names because i don't you know but there's been impressionists on the show uh in, in in the past who have been who've done very sound technically great impressions but there's no comedic take behind yeah. it. Yeah. So with Maya, I think we have see, we see a lot of uh, funny comedic takes. Does she sound 100% like Beyonce? It's okay. Like, I don't know. <laughs> you can kind of tell she's trying to play Beyonce. But there's like some sort of take there. With, same with Donatella Versace. She does a r- weird one of Scott Joplin, who's like a real person. She did a couple of... of some of my favorite Maya's work. Uh, uh, it wasn't quite an, an impression. It was kind of her take on like a historical figure, <laughs> like a funny yeah. take. But that, but there's the comedic value in it. So I, that was a really good point, Rebecca, about impressions uh, and and Maya and how she does mm-hmm. impressions. Uh, but I have a confession for you. Yeah, I'm one of those people who who has been on the fence about voting her in, and so Why? here's yeah. So here's my. And I, I am glad you asked me in that tone because I've asked myself in that tone. I'm like, what? In my judgy tone. Yeah. No, I've, told, I've asked myself in that judgy tone too. <laughs> uh, but I, I finally pinpointed it, I think. So Maya was on from 2000 to 2007. And I think, I think she spent much of her time on SNL in the wrong era for her skill set. I think like the early to mid 2000s, I think that catered to a lot of and then there's a lot of like lowbrow kind of humor. There was a lot. Of, and I think she was capable of so much more. I think she was very clever. and she, But she always she didn't always get a lot of clever sketches uh, mm-hmm. on. I think she was way more like her skill set was a lot more diverse than maybe the era catered to. So I and, and that that's just kind of my taste. But I think that's kind of what the era was. There was a lot of yeah. like and it's hard to describe from like about 2000 one to like 2005 it was a lot of edgelord humor it was a lot of like let's put people let's let's dress up an athlete in a wig and a dress let's yeah. put our female host and get just give her a wig and some jewelry and make her talk like a hip-hop affectation kind of character. Just, i don't know it's just like a it was a weird vibe in comedy just in general around that time so i don't i think i don't know if you could see where i'm coming from with maybe her skill set she would have been better off in a different time of SNL where yeah. she could have really shine. I think. I I could actually really agree with that. It was also a really saturated cast. So yeah. for everyone to stand out and saturated, not only by volume, but talent and big, big personalities. Like you see nowadays, even this season, it's a very saturated cast, but there are a lot of people that are really strong background characters that like they shine in that but i would say from her six seven years on the show it really was a lot of huge huge personalities comedically like kind of fighting for that spotlight there so the edgier or the probably more lowbrow you could get at the time i feel like the more that you shined on the show and that's what it needed to be then and that was kind of what we were seeing comedy at that time so i do agree with you there and Yeah, I feel like even now, just like learning about Maya and her just, I feel like she's very cultured and like intelligent outside of comedy. And that inspires a lot of it, like her Prince tribute band. 
And going through that, she has a lot of niche interests and quirks that I feel like if she was on a different season, even like on current season, the writing cast was different and they would really let it shine and kind of write things around someone that would understand. I think about Bo and Yang doing the choice of on sketch. Did it relate to everyone? No. But was it funny because it was someone doing something they were passionate about and understood and got? I feel like if Maya was on a more recent season, I would say probably from like 2015 till now, the writers would tailor things to her and she wouldn't just have to fit in and be the funny character in what she was doing. Mm -hmm. And you have her and Kristen Wiig as like a dynamic duo throughout the seasons together. And they are so different and their humor is so different. And I feel like although their partnership was something that we've seen from the show on and through that, I feel like it was more for Kristen to shine than it allowed for Maya to shine. And I think I that. that is probably the reason she isn't in this Hall of Fame. But as you look back, like taking a deeper eye to this and the reason why I'm so excited to talk about her is like she was just standard and reliable. Like you knew she was going to say something or sing something and we were going to laugh whether she was the star of it and whether it was even her like area to shine comedically. She always did trigger a laugh from the audience. So although I, you don't want to like pit women against each other, but I mm -hmm. kind of feel like the writers then had to pick the star and Kristen definitely got that spotlight. And Maya was more of a supporting role. And I actually feel like they could have balanced that a little different. Yeah. That's something that you just articulated that I think I've always felt but I never really articulated it to yeah. myself is like that dynamic with her and Kristen and maybe a little bit Amy. I think she and Amy were actually really good. So like, of course they did Bronx beat together and stuff, but they, I think they, they actually had like a, a really good partnership. I really, I wish that Maya, she, her last, she ended in, uh, on SNL in 2007. I wish she could have had a few more years because I think that the, that cast was just finding its groove around 2007. So I would wish Maya could have been a part of them really hitting the peak. Like she, could, I wish she could have done more stuff with Sudeikis and Hater, mm -hmm. and, and even developed more of a partnership with Kristen. So I think she was in a weird era, and she was part of when the show kind of flipped and got another golden era. But I wish she could have been part more of a more of that golden era than she was, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that actually is a really good point. Like, as they transitioned over, she was one of the cast members that transitioned with them, but mm -hmm. didn't get to see it through fruition, the way that, like, she probably should have after the year she put into it. Like, yeah. and if she was able right. to stick around and actually, like, help with the transition and do that and move that over. So that's an awesome point, because I feel like the show really flips each big era from, like, is who dominates it, especially I think like gender's a big thing. Like, are is it being carried by like Andy Samberg, Jason Sudeikis, Bill Hader, that that was a very male heavy, like mm -hmm. leading a lot of the sketches. And then you go to Kate McKinnon, Cecily and 80, and that was very, very female dominating. And I kind of wished even just as a general statement throughout the years, there was better balance and you would see more dynamic duos from like the women and the men on the cast. And I think that's actually something that SNL has really never quite nailed down since the early, early seasons. Um, mm -hmm. Like really from the not ready for primetime players that I think had the best balance between everyone had a role, but since the cast are so saturated now, it's easier to make a more bro -y sketch or a more <laughs> like female oriented sketch. And that's just natural and due to the nature. But I kind of feel like, that's what we're missing now is that sweet spot. You look at all the duos or trios or groups of people in the past from 2000 on, and there's never really like a male female dynamic duo leading that. Yeah. And I actually think like Maya and Fred could have done that. And we see Fred. in real life, we see in real life that they kind of are that dynamic yeah. duo. And we've seen that really come to terms after the show and all of that. But I think that's like an area that we've been missing for a while is like, having someone just really dominant that way. And I think that would just make maybe every sketch more reliable to this. So I talked to John about sketches that he all time favorites thinks is the funniest things with like Andrew Dismukes. And I'm like, yeah, I laughed. It wasn't like necessarily my <laughs> thing or like little things like that. And that's, I guess, reaching all the different people in the audience, but 
kind of looking for that sweet spot. And I feel yeah. like she could have been a really good bridge between that. She really could have. That's such a good point. And I was thinking of Fred too with yeah. like, Amaya and Fred. They could have had such a, uh, they could have built on like a, a, a dynamic because Fred stayed until what, 2012, something yeah. like that. So, so they could have had a few more years together. Yeah. See, great points, Rebecca. See, Maya is overdue in the Essendon Hall of Fame and you were overdue to appear on this podcast. I'm already it was meant to that. be. Yeah. It was meant to be then that I'm <laughs> yeah. here. To, I'm here to vouch for her, and then hopefully Seriously. vouch for a return on this podcast. I, I think you've already sealed a return. <laughs> Twenty yes. minutes in. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as Maya's work on SNL, what what kind of immediately stands out to you? Like you, we can we can kind of just talk about it like a specific character or sketch right now. Well, you did mention Bronx Beat, and that is the number one. Like. When I look back at my 10 favorite sketches of all time, I think Bronx Beat is really just up there in that in that list. Like when initially I'm like, okay, Maya's on the show. Who, who are we talking about? Bronx Beat is that for me. So you book, uh, you like to ride bikes. Yes, I traveled all over the country and found the best trails and rated them according to difficulty and size. And uh, uh-huh. you know how many times I had sex last year, Frankie? <laughs> 0.002. And it was my choice. This area down here, this area, it's got the Ghostbusters thing over it. No one's allowed in there. No trespassing. No trespassing. Closed for business. You know that red circle thing with the line, the Ghostbusters thing? Yeah. It's my choice. Yeah, you know what? When my husband wants to get sick. Sex- it's always funny. No matter when I watch it, no matter what mood I'm in, it is just always one that gets me laughing. And I think that was a good point you made about Amy and Maya's chemistry. Like, They have such a funny, like, chemistry in this, and their dialects, it's just a dumb sketch, (laughs) but it really just always hits. Sometimes you just get those where you're like, this is amazing, and that was pure gold, so that definitely stands out to me. It's a dumb sketch, but it's not. It's not yeah. a dumb sketch because they have these mannerisms so dumb. Like, you're, you're from New York, you said, right? Yes. Have you met these ladies? before (laughs) yes so i'm from long island so it's a little different but there's like there's a similarity between bronx and and certain parts of long island and i think especially like older generations like the accents are real like people actually sound like that (laughs) and i think that was around like an era with jersey shore was also like how are these people real but they are and the people of bronx beat those people exist and it's awesome to see, and it was like a really great depiction, and they really just took those characters to 110%, mm-hmm. and they were relatable. Like, I was able to be like, oh, that's who that is, <laughs> yeah. as someone from New York, and it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, that then that sketch was so musical, too. Like, the with when Amy talking and then Maya talking, like, the way they bantered back and forth, it was very musical. It was like... Just something about it, like to you had to be a, a, an amazing performer to get those beats down. Like, like uh, it was. Uh, I remember the Jake Gyllenhaal one when they, when mm-hmm. they were kind of flirting with the, with like they kind of flirted with their guests and stuff. But just like their the way they would bounce back and forth, she and Amy, there was just just real like music to it. That's whenever I watch those sketches, that's all my mind goes to. Yeah. It's just as a performer, she was just so good about hitting those exact beats. Is very conversational uh, and very relatable. I'm from New Mexico. I've been to New York, but you know, I'm not like an East yeah. Coast guy. Uh, but it was still like I felt like I know I knew those ladies. <laughs> yeah. F- oh, for sure. Like they they definitely exist, and I feel like some people got it and they were like, I could relate this. But other people that have never met anyone like that still were able to relate and be like, I saw this person on TV and. This was it was an awesome depiction. So that's like the number one sketch that really stands out to me. Yeah, and it's I don't think it's a coincidence too that they started doing these l- later in Maya's uh, tenure there on SNL. Yeah. Like when when the whole when the cast and the show as a whole was starting to flip into another golden era, and we saw something like Bronx Beat when she and Amy uh, came up with. So I don't think that's a, necessarily a coincidence that that these started happening uh, a little later. Uh, one mm-hmm. one that I revisited today that was just like pure Maya just owning it was that national anthem. Yeah, was that the, was that like one of the next ones that that was you? in my I that I was deciding which one I was going to bring up next. <laughs> yeah. and it was either that or the one I'll get to then after. But I love that. I mean, one of my like happy videos is watching Fergie sing the national anthem, and 
I could do every single quip and that's I think kind of what it was loosely based off of was Fergie for the Basketball Hall of Fame uh, sang the national anthem and took a lot of creative liberty <laughs> in a way that did not pay off. But I'm sure it's probably one of the most watched national anthems of any uh, sports event ever. And Maya so perfectly encapsulated that. But also, she's a super talented singer. So I think that was part of it. But Fergie at this national anthem just like went off and did all these ad libs and runs that were so funny. And to see SNL do that in a way that wasn't an exact copy and Mm -hmm. had Maya like fully just shine and go off on that. And like, that is quintessential Maya. Like when I'm imagining her in my head, she is just singing and doing something funny vocally and through singing. And I think that this sketch still holds up now because there's always, it's always relatable. Like there was a super viral video this month of this little girl that sang the national anthem again so horribly like at one of these games and i was like watching this one again yesterday and i was like oh it's like this little girl now but you could have watched it two years ago and related it to another just bad national anthem performance so yeah as long as people are singing the national anthem they're going to be singing it poorly because it's a hard song to sing so exactly. yeah, you're going to get, and these. I don't know why people keep doing that. Like <laughs> just sing the song as it was written. Like yeah. it's, I, it's very rarely paid off for people to just make it their own. And we're seeing that. I think this is just a relatable sketch, whether it was 20 years ago or today, cause you could always relate it to something going on. Through the bum night. <laughs> I feel like they told Maya maybe on that Monday, whoever, uh, maybe it was her that came up with the idea, but I feel like they just kind of told Maya, like, we need you to do a national anthem and kind of butcher it. Sing well, <laughs> but just like butcher it. And Maya's like, I got you. And and she came up with that. So, yeah, it was just so like her facial expressions were perfect. Her, I think she added in, she started singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game or something yeah. at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so, <it was> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was so perfect. That, that's like quintessential. I'm glad I revisited it again today because yeah. that you're right. That is quintessential uh, Maya in in that performance. Yeah. Uh, well, what else is quintessential Maya? She's so fun. The, she's so fun. The other one that I think like she shines out of a bigger cast is Super Showcase Spokesmodels. This, in my <laughs> mind, is just Kristen and Maya doing their thing. It's a spoof of The Price Is Right and. It's showing contestants what they would have won. So it's Kristen and Maya as the Vanna Whites walking around. I know that's Wheel of Fortune, not Price is Right. But um, walking around and being like the spokesperson. And you just watch like Kristen and Bill Hader just lose it. And it just shows like Maya was probably someone that was so fun to have on set. And someone that you look at and you're like, yes, I'm in this sketch with them. And she made them break just by being her. And standing out so much out of like the crowd of this sketch that it cracks me up. Like I'm a sucker for people that break in a sketch, especially when it's like actually funny. Yeah, and when it's not like forced or not like not, an inside like, joke type of thing. Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. You're gonna kick yourself when you see what Shauna and Vonda have in their cart. Look at this, Deborah. A lifetime supply of frozen chicken by chicken man. Imagine years of the years of the years of chicken. Right at your fingertips. The good, the good. Each chicken looks as good as this one. That's a chicken man guarantee. If your man likes chicken, you might like chicken. Was her voice kind of similar to like, remember that art dealer's one that she and Fred did? Yes. It sounds like this, the similar yeah. the Nooney, like it's almost <laughs> yeah. like a similar voice, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, Maya, like, Maya. Yeah, just we don't know what the rules of the game are still. Right. Like, what would a right answer be? And she just did such a good job here. 
Yeah, she, uh, she of course, Bill is known to break, but for good for good reason when you're working with somebody like Maya. Honestly, mm-hmm. I don't know how Vanessa Bear kept it together in that sketch. She's probably new and maybe afraid of getting fired, <laughs> so she didn't yeah. want to break in that sketch. But yes, yeah, yeah. That that was that was so good. There was one, and I don't know if you remember these or when it got a chance to go rewatch. They're hard to find. You got to know where, where to look. But she did one that I alluded to earlier, and it's an example to me of something very clever that Maya was able to do early on. Like th- these appeared in 2002 and 2003. It was Tennis Talk with time-traveling Scott Joplin. Let's start with you, 92 Andre Agassi. What's new with you? Uh, well, things are pretty great. I just won Wimbledon. I'm dating Brooke Shields. And I'm doing these pretty awesome commercials for Canon cameras. That's great. By the way, Patrick Swayze called. He wants his hair back. (laughs) How about you, present day Andre Agassi? What's going on with you? I'm really excited. I just had a second baby with my wife. So if you haven't seen it, if you don't, do you remember these, Rebecca? Vaguely, so okay. enlighten so me. I'll, yes, I'll <laughs> recap. So Scott Joplin is a real person. He was a composer. He basically is called like the godfather of ragtime kind of music. Mm-hmm. And so the premise was that Maya played Scott Joplin, who traveled, who 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 uh, was a time traveler, who became a time traveler. And through his time traveling experiences, he figured out that he really enjoyed tennis so he created a talk show, Time Traveling Tennis Talk with Time Traveling Scott Joplin. <laughs> so he would like have these have these tennis players on and pretty much like be passive aggressive and make these quips, but then like after after like Burns would go back and play like a ragtime ditty <laughs> and then come back and like like talk to him and be condescending and be funny at this and it was Maya like dressed up in a suit and yes. and short hair and, and it was just such a bizarre to me, very clever, very like, where did this come from? And especially for that time in 2002 and 2003, it really like stood out uh, yeah. amongst peers. But that's an example to me like of, of her being able to play in like more just kind of subtle, weird kind of things rather than over the top things. So that yeah. that's one if you if if you hadn't seen that in a while, if listeners, you hadn't seen that in a while, it's around season 28 and 29, Tennis Talk with time traveling Scott Joplin and, and okay. Rebecca like I, I think that she, one. yeah yeah go check that but I think Rebecca like she she's versatile that's the versatility that I was talking about with Maya mm-hmm. yeah the other thing that I've noticed I know we spoke about impressions and we kind of touched on that earlier on but Maya comes from a, a unique background obviously we love that she is a very successful Nepo baby uh, Minnie Ripperton's her mom And she's black and Jewish. And I think she was on the cast at a time to be kind of, she was a black woman representative. So for a lot of the impressions we saw, they weren't spot on. But within being that character and playing characters that most of the rest of the cast couldn't play, uh, like at the time, she took these roles and didn't just say, okay, I'll just do an impression. She like completely dramatized their characterization to a T and to a hundred percent. And I think she took her background of being both black and Jewish, like in Bronx beat, the the people that related to me, I'm like, Oh, those are Jewish people from Long Island that I know. Although it's not technically that from the Bronx, she always let herself shine. So a few of her impressions are just like when I looked back and really, really standing out to me is not like, wow, you are Oprah, but (laughs) you are making me hysterically laugh. So that specific one is just Oprah's favorite things. I have down, and then also the Maya Angelou, I Know Why the Cage Birds Laugh as a show. Hello, child. I am the rock. I am the river. I am the one who put a pie under the butt of Morgan Freeman. Whoa! Watch as Maya Angelou pranks her esteemed colleagues. Look out! It appears I have sat in a pie. I suppose you have. I feel no shame sitting in that pastry. Just human nature, I suppose. (laughs) It has been an honor. So she really took these and made them her own. 
and was like, okay, if you want me to do this, I'm still going to be Maya in this because I can't do a spot on Maya Angelou impression. <laughs> so I'm going to make it a show instead of okay. just like an interview with my uh, Maya Angelou. So I think that's where she really got to shine in a lot of those times at the time. I know we were saying before she was never specifically written for like as much as I think she deserved to be. But in a lot of her impressions, I think is where the writers really had fun with her. And she created characters even out of real people who, who I wanted to imitate as well. You said you don't do impressions. I sure as hell don't do impressions, <laughs> but with something like her Whitney Houston, yes. I, 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 I find myself almost mimicking it. My sister-in-law we, we sometimes will get to talking about SNL and she'll always be like, oh, I'll always go back to to Maya Rudolph's Whitney Houston, Bobby Brown, Bobby Brown. <laughs> and we'll just kind of sit there and say Bobby Brown to each other. Eric is a real Geico customer, not a paid celebrity. So to help him tell his story, we paired him with Whitney Houston. I thought I was going to have to postpone my exams. That's when I got in my SUV, threw that sucker in reverse and drove backwards all the way to Dion Warwick's house. <laughs> Geico took care of everything immediately, and I passed sociology. I passed Bobby Brown the other day, and I threw an old bag of chicken McNuggets at his head. In a shocking what love can do. In a shocking what love can do. Geico. In a shocking Real Rex. Cars. She has that kind of like energy and, and creates these characters that even, even fans, like we want to like, imitate and we want to like act like that because she radiates like that energy on screen Maya does exactly and that's why I think bringing her back as Kamala Harris was such a specific choice that I think SNL took they could have had someone come back or at they were that was actually at a time where they were just bringing people in left and right um to play people that weren't specifically in the cast and they chose Maya and she did such a unique take on Kamala that I think was more successful than someone that was like uncanny. Like, I mean, you look at Sarah Palin and Hillary Clinton with Amy and Tina and although they were really funny, they were really spot on impressions where mm -hmm. they've had the characters in the room together, but Maya took Kamala and made it why people like to laugh with her and at her and go through all of those phases where I thought it was like a genius pick, but it was actually interesting because they were bringing back a lot of people while Alec Baldwin, I don't think, was the funniest Donald Trump. He was super, super spot on, but they made such a specific choice by having Maya come back and be Kamala with not a spot on impression, but added a lot of light. Maybe she yeah. wasn't as like serious as having like Biden or Trump and someone that like we actually want to convey like this is our political take and the stance in this sketch, but just having Kamala is like, Oh, you know you're gonna say one or two lines in this that'll make me laugh. Senator Harris. You see, this is what they do, Susan. They avoid taking any responsibility. We for do not. Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. <laughs> I'm speaking. Well, well I'm just but trying I'm speaking. Oh, but yes, but Yeah, I... but I'm speaking. Mm. See, I'm speaking right now as Stoya Blondo, Nevada, Arizona, some parts of Texas. I'm speaking. I understand that. I understand. I yeah, I don't think you do I because do. you're talking and I'm speaking. I love that choice to bring her back. And I think having a pe previous cast member come back for a recurring, like, cold open bit and then pop up in a lot of the sketches that we've seen throughout those seasons where she was back, that's, uh, that's enough to put her in the Hall of Fame for me. Yeah, yeah, that's so. So you do look at times that they appeared outside of their time, like as an official cast member. Like you do take that into account when you're looking yes. at cast members, for sure. And also impact after the show, I think okay. is it, that's what I do because it's not like the SNL Hall of Fame in my mind is. Oh, you were on SNL and you came from this, and it was all encompassing. Like, mm -hmm. what did you do on the show? What did you do with your platform after the show? And a lot of people don't utilize that platform after the show as well as others. And I think Maya is someone that really took that by storm and completely is just now kind of killing it and consistently killing it since her time on SNL back on the show as host, as recurring characters and that. And 
I take that all into consideration. But just besides her specific years on the show, it's like you have one of the biggest com- uh, comedy platforms in the whole world. Are you going to actually make use of what you had on here? Right. And I say without doubt, she definitely did. And I mean, just to bring up the, I mean, the number one thing everyone's probably thinking of of her time outside the show is Bridesmaids. Like sure. she yeah. made a legendary movie. Like that is one that goes down in the books. When you look back at history, you're like, oh, that is just an all time funny movie. It's, it's the an same way. Great, yeah. Yeah, Will Ferrell had all of these movies as well after. Obviously, Maya doesn't have as much, I'd say, on her repertoire there. But you look back, and that's one of the all-time great comedic movies of all time that I'm like, you were on this. You brought your friends into this cast. You brought Kristen into this. And, like, they all worked so well together that it... I related to SNL because it's a Maya and Kristen movie that was so funny and so amazing that I'm like... How could she not be in the Hall of Fame? The amount of times I watch Bridesmaids a year, just when I'm sitting with people and we're like, what movie should we put on? Bridesmaids. Oh, it's a classic. No. Yeah, no, that's a cla- that's a perfect one uh, to put on when you have when you have nothing else to go to. No, exactly. it's a it's a it's an all time great comedy. Yeah, and I'm I'm starting to warm up to the idea more <laughs> of of thinking about like cast members and and their impact even outside of their technical like when they were a cast member on the show. I think you bring up good points and I think that's perfectly valid to look at cast members that way. And Kamala Harris is a great example. And with Maya, you almost have to like take into to cameos in, into account because she's been back on the show mm-hmm. so much. And she played Kamala. Like there was, and we were talking about impressions. Like she found a, an angle for her Kamala Harris. They even told us what that angle was, like the cool aunt, right? Like yeah. she played Kamala Harris said, I'm the cool aunt or whatever, and I'm going to play it like that. So she, she was like the fun aunt who might have like rapped a little bit. But then they <laughs> still made fun of her for saying like, that little girl was me, like this kind of poking fun at, at, yeah. at Kamala at the same time. So she did find an angle. She has had an impact on the show 2024 now, and, I, and, and none of us would be shocked if we saw Maya Rudolph uh, come on the show in some capacity. I know Punky Johnson. They had her play Kamala. She didn't. She didn't mm-hmm. get any speaking roles um, no. when she played Kamala. But I don't know if they're what their plans are with that. But we won't yeah. be surprised if Maya's like comes back to the show at any point and has yeah. A major Kristen's impact. hosting. Yeah, you're so, right. Uh, yeah, as we're recording really cool this. Cameo. Yeah, yeah, as we're recording this, Kristen Kristen scheduled the host. I think on April sixth. Yes. So that'll like be. That. Yeah. Interesting. And I would not be shocked at all if she made an appearance there. I actually have a question for you, Thomas. Just okay. so I know how to angle to all the listeners here. Who has anyone had a hundred percent um poll numbers into the Hall of Fame or who was around like the highest? So I couldn't I kind of understand their impact versus maybe why mm-hmm. Maya wasn't in there. I kind of think somebody like Will Farrell. Or yeah. like Eddie Murphy, but I, th- I seem to remember, or Bill Hader. I think like people like that have been in yeah. the nineties. Nobody's Got gotten one hundred percent, and it wow. doesn't matter in any sort of Hall of Fame, any sort of vote. You, you could be the best basketball, best football player, best baseball player of all time, and th- those guys don't get a hundred percent. Nobody's got a hundred percent of the vote uh, in that the SNL Hall of Fame. Yeah. Okay. That yeah, that's interesting. Then I guess those. I think those people probably have had more impact on the actual show. But then I look at Will, and yes, he had amazing sketches. When you look back at Let's List, everyone's favorite sketches of all time, you're going to have more cowbells, and you're going to have a lot of Will appearances. But I actually feel like his impact was made more after the show and a lot of the work he's done. So I'm seeing him a little more similar to Maya than, like, Bill Hader, who absolutely, like, obviously has impact off the show. But, like... SNL was his playground and he just completely ran that to the ground the same way that like Kate McKinnon has and all of that like when you're watching them off the show you're always going to relate them back to being on the show but now you're actually going to look at Will Ferrell and you're going to be like oh that's Buddy the Elf like that's probably where your mind goes actually more than oh you're on SNL it's someone that's just so engraved in the culture that you're like oh i forget you were on, you were, like you don't forget but oh you were on snl instead of bill Hader, it's like oh snl's bill Hader is going to be in this or snl's kate mckinnon and i think maya's impact is 
uh, probably more off the show, which is why she's been teetering around that 50% range for a little yeah. bit now. But I think people should take that into consideration because you're not supposed to be a Keenan and be honest enough for <laughs> a million years. Not everyone could be that considering there's only been right. one person. There's only been one Keenan on the show. And you want to take this life-changing opportunity and make an impact in comedy and in pop culture and in the world. And I feel like Maya has, has had such success in that so far. So take that point. into consideration when you vote, yeah. listeners. <laughs> yeah, no, that's such a good point. I want to use like my, my wife as like a case study for what you just said. Uh, because she likes SNL. She's not as much of a fan as me. She probably only watches and started watching because of me. Yeah. But so, but she likes it and she'll watch. But she only she knows Will Ferrell more for like Elf and and things outside of SNL. She knows Maya Rudolph more honestly for it popping up in in shows that we watch and seeing her all over the place. Probably Bridesmaids. So my wife is somebody who. That person that that you said maybe knows those people more for outside of SNL. My wife wouldn't know Bill Hader unless you know she went back and watched earlier seasons. If she saw Bill Hader yeah. pop up on something, she wouldn't be like, "Oh, it's Bill Hader." But she sees Maya Rudolph, and my wife's like, "Oh, that's Maya Rudolph. I love Maya Rudolph." Yeah, again, exactly. good play. She, my wife, is like, I, "I love that they got Maya Rudolph to play the judge," and or an Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Maya Rudolph yes. played like what Dion Warwick. No, who did she play? Yes. Yeah, wait. Something it like wasn't. That. Yeah, and she's just like a standard. Also, I think about Big Mouth. Um, the second yeah, you yeah, hear yeah. the hormone monster, she is hysterical. And I think Nick Kroll did an awesome job choosing Maya uh-huh. to be such a pivotal character in that show. Obviously, it's um, it's a, a cartoon, so she's it's on her face, but she doesn't need to be her face. So, yeah, she was Dionne Warwick. Dionne um, Warwick, in my, on- Yes, yeah. and, and I thought it was that sure. or Diana Ross or yeah, or, or some, or somebody one of like, those. Well, yeah, somebody D-names. like that. Yeah, <laughs> but you could tell, like, like in Big Mouth, she put her her stamp or complete stamp on it. She, uh, no, I, I'm drawing a blank right now. That she she popped up recently in something, and I was like, oh, Maya, Maya was just so perfect in that. But that that's what she does. Maya yeah. just leaves an impression on the screen. No matter what, if it's two minutes, if it's 30 minutes, Maya's going to leave such a great mark. Oh, it was Documentary Now. It's like my my, my oh, favorite yes. episode of Documentary Now is Test Pattern, which is a take off of their lampooning and paying uh, homage to the talking head, Stop Making Sense. Okay. And Maya's in that uh, on Documentary Now, and she, she was wonderful in it. She was perfect. She just makes such an impact. Rebecca, just no matter how yeah. long she's on the screen. Literally, I'm looking at oh, like her IMDb right now, and she's in literally everything, just as a voice, as a name. Like whether she just makes a short appearance, I'm like looking at this, and I'm like, oh wait, yeah, she was in that. She was in specifically the movie Booksmart, one of mm-hmm. my all-time favorite movies. She's a voiceover, and I, and I could tell you the scene that she's in in my head because. Even though it's just her voice in a non-cartoon movie where it's a lot of big names and a lot of cameos, I remember the exact part she was in in that movie just by thinking about it. And she's done a lot of um, cartoons and like co- comic movies there. And yeah, she just makes a lot of appearances in things. And if you look at who's starring in those or producing them, it's a lot of just big name comedians that love her and respect her. Mm-hmm. And I think... She's a super respected name in the comedy scene and the community that people want to hang out with her. And I feel like if she could come back to host for season 50, and if not, I feel like she would just be a big presence in whatever sort of celebration and special that they do for the 50th anniversary. Yeah, she's going to absolutely be a huge presence. So we can wrap this up by one last sort of plea, I guess. And you can look at me, Rebecca, as a stand-in for all those voters who haven't voted because I've been on the fence a little bit, maybe more Mm -hmm. so than I should. So you can look at me and scold me if you need to and tell me and SNL Hall of Fame voters out there why they should finally vote Maya Rudolph into the hall. So I'm going to think about this from a legacy point of view. And if you were to, if Maya never passed her audition onto SNL, would your life be changed? And would pop culture and the world be changed? For sure. 
SNL would have been different without her on it. I think she was a pivotal cast member at the time where maybe she wasn't the star in every sketch, but her impressions and her quips and one-liners are things that you forever remember. And then her mark in pop culture and history throughout the years after her being on the show. She is someone that if she was not at the 50th special, you'd be like, where's Maya? And I think that alone just would make you want to vote her into the Hall of Fame because I think she really has made her mark on not only SNL and the way that kind of impressions are done from then on into just the real world. Like, what if Bridesmaids didn't exist? What would we do? We'd be very missing out. That would be a hole in my heart. So she's someone that I think really made her mark and took her 15 minutes of fame and really impacted culture and the comedy scene from then on. So I would vote for her to be in the Hall of Fame. And she's been on the cusp for five seasons now. And I think that's telling that people really do love her, just probably haven't fully mentally appreciated her until this episode. So vote for Maya for this. Thank you so much, Thomas and Rebecca. That was spectacular, relitigating the case, as Thomas says, of Maya Rudolph. I, too, am surprised she's not in the Hall of Fame. She wouldn't necessarily be in my Hall of Fame, but I'm shocked that she's not in. She's got you know so many votes at this point. So this is her last chance. This is her last kick at the can, and you got to get out and vote for her. May 6th, voting will open, and it's very important for you to exercise your franchise and make that vote. So that's what I got to say about that. Let's listen to a sketch. This is Maya Rudolph on Weekend Update, and it's, it's a dandy. So let's give that a listen right now. This week... Whitney Houston auctioned off over $175,000 worth of items from her storage unit in Irvington, New Jersey. Here to talk about it is Whitney Houston. Oh, it's all in the storage unit. Ooh, come on down and buy my junk, baby. Ooh. Hey, hello. Hello, Mrs. Houston. Always nice to have you. Here. Unloading, unloading my baggage. Yes, mama is lighter, light as a feather, stiff as a board, MEP. Okay, that's wonderful. It's wonderful, Mrs. Houston. Yes, polar coaster. That storage unit has completely slipped my mind. Opened it up, it looked like the U story from Silence of the Lambs. Straight up Sanford and Son. <laughs> Okay, yes. so, Whitney, you sold everything. That's great. Oh, no. Uh-uh. Hell to the hell to the hell to the no. <laughs> there are still some items that gotta go. And I ain't gonna lie, this legendary recording artist needs the cash. Mama needs money. And for that, you can blame Bobby B. <laughs> Total waste of my time, Bobby B. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Okay, Whitney, well... Ah. Well... <laughs> left some of our viewers might be interested in helping you out oh baby you're a genius let me put on my cheetahs let's see uh four solid gold toilets uh three complete seasons of 227 on video cassette uh wind machine very important eight monogrammed fur capes they're perfect for your lady if her initials are wh or bb for bobby brown 600 kangle visors a Lexus SUV, whose horn honks tenderoni. <laughs> a warped platinum record that Mama used to heat a Dijon or pizza. And a marble statuary of Bobby B and I with our business hanging out. <laughs> and it's all going once, going twice. Nobody? No? Uh, how, how, how many golden toilets? Four. You know what? I'll give you $15 for everything. So, Jamie Peeping. All right. Wendy Houston, everybody. Oh, man. Yeah, that's a good one. And uh, I don't know if it's going to sway you or not. There are some better sketches, there's no doubt. Um, but 
it's tough finding sketches for this program because so many are visual. And if you think of her Beyonce character, for example, it's it's a very visual thing. But uh, I I don't know. I thought that was great. Whitney Houston. Damn. She was so big at one point, wasn't she? Gosh. Well, next week on the SNL Hall of Fame, we are joined by the grand poobah of the Saturday Night Network, one John Schneider. He will be in discussion with Thomas about the stellar work of the great Will Forte. Please check this out wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're doing that, do me another favor. On your way out, as you pass the Weekend Update exhibit, turn out the lights, because the SNL Hall of Fame is now closed. Thanks for listening to the SNL Hall of Fame podcast. Make sure to rate, review, share, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media at SNLHOF. This is Doug Denant saying, this is Doug Denant saying, see you next week. Podcasts and such.